Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Lynn, and I have alcoholism. Hi. Um, John, where's John? Thank you for asking me to speak. <laughs> I'm laughing because um, I can tell you what my alcoholism is doing right now, and it's telling me to go running for the hills that um, I have nothing to say, I have no experience, um, and that you will not relate to anything I have to say. And that's what my mind is telling me right now. And that's not the truth. It's not the truth. And luckily, because I've been around a little while now, um, I have experience that says the otherwise. And I've been coming to these meetings um, for, in prime time for about three years now, maybe even a little bit longer now. And this is where I learned, you know, that my mind, that <clears throat> I don't just have an unmanageable life, I have an unman- unmanageable thought life. Um, just to give you a little background, a little history about me, um, I just turned six years sober in May. Um, I actually live across the street, and when I first got sober and just out of treatment, I came to the Saturday night meeting, and you guys talked a lot about God, and I hadn't done a step. I just was dry, and I went running for the hills because there was no way that I wanted anything to do with God. And talk about preconceived ideas. Um, I never had an experience with God. God wasn't talked about at all in, in my home growing up, and I had these ideas, and I I bristled with antagonism just hearing about God. I, I wanted to figure out AA and, and the 12 steps without a power greater than myself. And, um, you know, I tried that for about eight months and was getting more and more restless, irritable, restless, discontent, irritable. And um, I talked to somebody, and I said, you know, I really don't feel like drinking and using, but I'm floundering, and she looked me straight in the eye and said, on your own power, you will drink and use again. There is no question you will. And she said that to me with with such, you know, it was heart to heart, and I believed her. And I knew that it was time to really get down to understanding what my disease was. And I will tell you, I didn't, uh, I went through the steps in a process not, Not in prime time. I went through um, the big book, um, paragraph by paragraph, really line by line, and I had a spiritual awakening of the educational variety. I really understood the mechanics of the steps. It was about a, it was about a nine month process. And um, in that time, I started coming back to meetings a little bit. I'd met Astrid and started hanging out and, um, what I realized, as great as the step process was, I hadn't built a relationship with this power. I understood why I needed a power in my life. I saw my unmanageable life. I um, I saw what self-reliance looked like. I saw how I played God. I was willing to believe in a higher power, but I didn't know how to build that relationship. The meetings I was going to didn't talk about how to build a relationship with God. I just didn't know how. And so I, I, that's, that's when prime time was introduced to me. And when I came back to prime time, after going through the step process and really understanding why I need a God of my own understanding in my life, all of a sudden I was way more open-minded than I was before. And so One of the things I like to say when um, I'm asked to speak in prime time um, is because I I look around the room and I listen to your shares, and I respect this room so much. I've gotten so much um, 
out of everybody's knowledge and experience and had my own experiences based on what you guys do. But if there's if there's anybody new in the room that feels like I did about the whole God thing, I understand. And um, for me, I couldn't really start to build my relationship with God until I understood what was blocking me from God, which I learned more in my inventory. So just please stick around, and we all, we all, if we do the steps, and the steps talk about, um, you know, we find this power, you know, as a result of these steps. It's not always in step two and three. So if for whatever reason you're struggling, hopefully you'll hear something and you'll be able to put into application some of the practices that I talk about that helped me and others when they're sharing. Um, so um, what I learned when I started coming to prime time was what my unmanageability looked like. Um, and it's in my mind. My my mind is is warped. It it has perception problems. It just I listen to what you say, but I'm not really listening. I my mind is talking and I'm talking to myself and I'm judging what you guys are saying and I'm not even present. I'm not even present. And so what I was taught here was the first the first thing I had to really learn and understand and accept is I had to become aware of this. I had to actually see it. And I, I saw it by listening to what you guys saw, how what what your minds were talking about and how it manifested in your life. And um for me just sitting sitting here, I mean, it was it was on. It was on. I mean that is what my mind was doing, and with six years and sponsoring women, and I'm, I'm, uh, I've built a beautiful relationship with a God of my understanding that when I go to it, when I'm spiritually connected to this power, I'm good. I can actually even trust my mind now because I've practiced this, but when I'm spiritually separated, I am a mess, and for a few minutes, I, that's where I was tonight. Um, uh, Ken read something in, in How It Works, and it, it talked about God, and all of a sudden, there was a moment where I, it just, I felt God. I felt the presence of God, and I was able to connect, and literally, the sense of calm came came over me and then I looked around the room and I saw Ricky who saw me come in and I saw other people that I haven't seen in a while and I look around this room and I go these people are my friends these people help me these people want me to build a relationship with God and want to follow this path with me and there's plenty of people in this room that um, I've gone to women's stags with, and we've we've practiced this, and we've shared our alcoholism, and we've shared our crazy minds, and then we've shared the solution, and we get past it. And it's, I look at this room, and like Mike said, the birthday guy, I, I'm so full of gratitude because of this room, because um, if not, I might have just gone on going to meetings feeling like I did the steps, and not really understanding that it's a practice. It's a way of life. Um, So um, back to alcoholism, because the format's alcoholism, ego, and self-obsession. I gave you an example of the self-obsession, and and, um, that happens a lot. Um, And my alcoholism is the fault-finding, self-talking mind. where it manifests most in my life is in my professional life. Um, my mind, I work uh, in a professional services firm for CPAs. I'm a girl who didn't go to college. I work with um, a lot of partners with multiple degrees and advanced degrees, and I consult with them on in an administrative capacity, but at a high level. And... My mind, as we're having discussions, my mind is saying, they're looking at you saying, you don't know what you're talking about. I mean, loud and clear, that is what 
That is what my disease tells me. My disease tells me that I'm not enough. I'm not enough for my boyfriend. I'm not, I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not thin enough. I'm not, I'm just not enough. And it talks to me with great authority, really, really strong authority. And, you know, before program, I, my mind would tell me something and I just thought it was the truth. I, that's just, I mean, why wouldn't it? I just, I always, I always reacted based on what my mind told me, not even knowing that it wasn't the truth. And what I learned from the steps is that I live in, I live in fear, in self-centered fear, and that fear drives these lies, these delusions that I'm not enough when I am enough. When experience shows me that I've worked for this firm for six years, since I got sober, actually, um, and I've been promoted, and I get bonuses, and I get good reviews. But every single month in these scheduling meetings when I have to come up with solutions, it is like Groundhog Day. It is like Groundhog Day. And, and that's what my mind does. And so what do I do? I, I need to practice. I need to practice the principles. I need to, I need to just slow down and ask God to guide my thinking. I, one of my, one of my favorite prayers is the set aside prayer. God, please enable me to set aside everything I think I know for an open mind and a new experience. Help me to see the truth. Because I now know from the step process that my mind lies to me. So my question is, whenever I'm disturbed, is, God, please, please help me see the truth. And, um, you know, I slow down. I, I, sometimes I have to go outside and literally breathe God in and breathe new energy. And I literally, physically will breathe out my negative thinking and breathe God in. And how I do that for me, and I know I've, I've, um, I've talked to sponsees about this and, and we, we practiced it together is literally finding the God in something outside or inside. Looking at the God in Jonathan. Looking at his cool look, his glasses, his hat, and he's so cool and just Seeing the God in Jonathan, looking for the God in a baby, you know, being strolled down the street, looking at a flower, looking, just finding something, and just practicing the presence of God to just calm me down. And that that practice alone has really helped guide me in getting to a place where then, if I need to, I can call my sponsor or I can get an intuitive thought or, um, you know, some sort of inspiration to do the next indicated right thing. Um, so um, that is that is an example of how, how my alcohol, alcoholism uh, manifests in the day I'm in. Um, and, you know, as far as, my ego, it's all ego driven. My ego wants, it's, it's disease ego. I'm not, I'm not overly, uh, educated in the whole Harry Tebow papers. Um, and I actually hope to go through that at some point. But, but what I do know is that, um, some of the characteristics of the ego is the defiance and the grandiosity. And I can see where I'm defiant. I can see where somebody strongly suggests I take an action and I, I think that I can go the other way. I, I can just literally defy what is being suggested by a very reputable, reliable source, somebody I trust, and I have to, I have to go right instead of left. Um, and you know, it's an experience sometimes that I have to, I have to go through. And, um, and hopefully that experience will help me the next time follow some suggestions or follow the guidance I'm, I'm feeling inside that I'm getting, um, from God. And, you know, for me, I don't always know what God's will is for me, but I usually know what it's not. 
I get that ping in my stomach. It just goes, it just, it just, it's like, oh, don't do that. Lynn, that really doesn't sound like a good idea. It really doesn't. And I thought, eh, you know, let's give it a try. And, and, you know, and so what I get to do is I get to stop and I get to become aware of that and see the experience of it not working and seeing where self-reliance failed me yet again and playing God failed me yet again. And, you know, I'm back at, I'm once I see it, once I become aware of it and see it, my mind becomes open. So I'm open to bringing in a power greater than me. And I get to hit the reset button and I get to make first the third step decision to quit playing God because it doesn't work. And then I, you know, thy will not mine be done. And I move into the other direction. And, you know, it's a practice. We talk about practicing these principles in, in all our affairs. You know, it is a practice. I so don't do it perfectly. Um, there's a lot of women in this room that have helped me along the way. Um, I can't always get to God on my own. But, you know, the important thing for me is aligning myself with like-minded people that are on the same path, that that I can call Astrid and say, my mind is absolutely killing me. Or sometimes she'll call me out of the blue. I don't talk to her all that frequently these days. And sometimes she'll just call me, just intuitively call me and see what's up. And I can just expose what's going on and um, get some relief because there's friends, there's people in the program that will tell me the truth. And ultimately, ultimately, that's what I want. I want to seek the truth today. I don't want to live in delusion today. I, it, it doesn't work for me. It, it doesn't work for me. Living in my, my character defects, it, they don't work for me. They don't work. I mean, they work for a while, just like the drinking and using work for a while. But when it stops working and I get really honest, I I prefer to live a more simple life. Um, I prefer to slow down and to, you know, be, um, to contemplate this power in my life and to, you know, let it guide me, let it guide me. Um, so how much more time do I have? Really? That long? Thanks, Michael. <laughs> um, all right. <laughs> I was telling somebody uh, before I before I spoke that the first time I spoke here, there were a lot of people here. Uh, it was, I think, my third birthday, and I think my mom was here, and my son was here who gave me a cake, and my sponsor was here, and everybody was looking at me, and I literally went blank. I mean, probably for two minutes, and what I got to practice, which I may have to pull out right now is I had to I had to pause and I literally had to meditate for a minute and ask God to please give me the right words or the words to say because I literally I looked around at all your faces and you're all looking at me and you know it's important my ego says I need to say something important I mean I want you to walk out I want you to buy CDs and how how many CD, how many CDs did I did I sell I mean you know I hear that around there and oh my gosh you don't have to buy a CD you do not have to buy a CD but that's what that's what this that's what this disease does for me and so so I, I expose that. I become aware of it. Before I'm aware of it, I have no choice. I, there's, I'm just in it. So there's no step one. The awareness is, the, is the, the key. I become aware of it. Then I have a choice. Do I want to stay with the lower power 
or do I want to do I want to connect with my higher power? And you know, I I have a lower power with me all the time and the higher power with me all the time. And I, once I become aware of it, when I'm in it, that's when I get to choose. And I've had so many beautiful experiences trusting and relying on this power even though I don't know what the heck is going to happen in the future, that most of the time, once I can become aware of it, I I go to the higher power. And, again, it's because I align myself with people that are on this path that are not just going to meetings, that are not hanging around AA. They're in AA. And being in AA for me is, you know, is working three sides of the triangle for that balance because ultimately that's what I want. I want balance. You know, I, I, I want the recovery. I want to be working with others. I, going through the steps and applying the steps and having a change of character and doing things that used to baffle me, and 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 sharing it with another person and seeing them change, there is nothing greater. There is nothing greater than that. And, you know, a lot of you don't know me. Um, six years ago, um, I wanted to die. I mean, my best thinking was I could not stop using and drinking, and I dug myself into such a hole that the only thing, my solution was to kill myself. And luckily I got honest with somebody, but I was probably 70 pounds heavier and then gained another 50 in sobriety. Um, you know, one of, one of the other things that I'm, I'm absolutely powerless over that I did not know until I got sober was my, my physical allergy to sugar and other foods. And, um, at three years sober, sponsoring women, getting heavier, taking women through the big book, going through steps one, two, and three, and realizing I was not applying what I was teaching to sponsees because my food addiction was was driving me. And um, my sponsor from Primetime um, strongly suggested that I go to another program. I didn't want to go to another program. I was I had my heels dug in prime time. I, I mean, I loved the meetings, going to all the meetings, and I did not want to do it. And for a good six months, I didn't do it, and I stayed miserable. And then the surrender came, and the surrender came because I was wanting to die again. I felt like such a fraud, feeling like a fraud after getting, after seeing the opposite of that, after starting to receive some of the promises, it's a horrible place to be. And so I surrendered and um, went to another program. And, you know, I some of my relationships in prime time and some of my other meetings, because I'm also a member of Cocaine Anonymous, where I ac- actually got sober, um, you know, they changed. My relationships changed a little bit. And the miracle is... I've lost the physical weight, but I have an even deeper, better relationship with God because I could just stop and surrender and trust and and take suggestions from others in another program. And you know, I wouldn't have I wouldn't have planned I wouldn't have planned this. I didn't think this is where I would be. And I miss my friends in prime time, and I miss my friends in my other fellowship. And I'm having a beautiful experience in what I've learned is my core addiction. It's The food is my core addiction. And so that's where I'm of service most these days. And um, that's what keeps me honest, because that's my truth today. Um, And John knows, I kid with him, you know, we all – we all excel in, in different things. I love taking women through the book. I love being of service in that way. Speaking is not my favorite. That is not my favorite thing. And yet, once I'm here and once I see all of you, John, and I mean this from the bottom of my heart, thank you for led, thank you for asking me to share. I, I really appreciate it because, um, my life has changed. My character has changed. 
and um, and I'm still in my infancy in my sobriety, and I realize that I just I just keep practicing the best I can uh, in the day I'm in today, and it is all about today. Um, and um, you know, I haven't heard the bell, but I think I'm going to say thanks for letting me share. <laughs> Full alcoholic. Thank you, Lynn, for your share. Uh, you know, uh, I don't know, I love, I'm so glad that I found this way of life. Um, I no longer tinker with the program, I apply it to my life. And that's, it's such a great relief to have that. Um, you know, uh, I believe the book refers to it as synthet- synthetic knowledge. And it's the, the knowledge that, you know, the world, you know, it's, it's our human resources. Um, and, uh, you know, those have failed me. Those have failed me in my life so many times that I, I, I question all of the resources that I have, even my mind sometimes. Even though I've been restored to right thinking, I still haven't restored myself to right acting all the time so you know that's one of the the hard parts of this program is to align all those things with god's will because i sure don't know what god's will is for me in my life but i i do what i do know is that i couldn't live the way i was living any longer and uh when i came into this program you know i had some years sober and i had some some knowledge some self-knowledge and that availed me nothing you know it, it got me it got me two years sober and, and miserable, you know, and, and, and still a, a jerk and treating people like, you know, less than, you know, out of fear. So um, I'm not afraid anymore. I don't. I have a lot of fear that comes into my life, but I'm not afraid anymore. There's a difference. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but it's internal. You know, my. When I get into, when fear crops up in my life, I, I turn that stuff over to God. It doesn't always happen immediately, but that back and forth action has created this connection with, with a higher power that I don't, I don't care to explain it. You know, I just know that it works. Um, I had a very close friend of mine pass away, uh, in May. I didn't even know. I found out from his son. And this was the person who had, done an intervention on me when I was 13 years old and uh, he was 27 years sober and he decided to put a put put a needle back in his arm after all those years and uh, he passed away in May and uh, I got to relay this message to my uncle who got sober at the same time as he did and he broke down and he was crying to me and uh he was he actually took me in when my mother had passed from her disease as the result of her disease she died from this disease um thank god she had a few years sober but it just it just makes it confirms for me that i have to main, i have to my spiritual condition is the most important thing in my life my connection with those with the higher power is the most important thing in my life Not the money, not the monetary stuff, not the financial gain, not the job, not the girl, all that stuff. That stuff doesn't, it's not important if I can't treat people decently, you know. So, anyways, I really thank you, Lynn. I've known you for a few years now in this program, and you're a great example of of this discipline, you know. So, um, I, I really appreciate you, and thank you. Donna alcoholic um thank you so much for your share i got so much out of it um this meeting is really special to me it was my first meeting i ever came to um before i got sober and i was so scared like terrified i sat right in the front and i didn't understand a word anyone was saying at all it literally felt like a foreign language um 
And it was just, it was terrifying. So if you're new, um, that is a normal feeling because I felt that way. Um, and it gets better. It, it's honestly the best thing I've ever done, and I'm so grateful to be sober today. Um, I've been instructed to share as much as possible about something. I did something really just not sober and dishonest. I, like, it was pretty much stealing kind of in a way. I don't know. <laughs> Sort of. It was sort of stealing. I, I don't know how sort of, I don't know how to explain it. Um Yeah. Um I did it because everyone else was doing it, which always works out really well. Um But I feel really terrible about it. Like I have that pit in my stomach that you were talking about when like you aren't doing God's will and like that is how I felt and I've been feeling that way for like 48 hours straight, and I have the worst anxiety about it, and um, it's just interesting because it just, it shows me how much I've changed, I mean, okay, I should have not done it in the first place, but I feel remorse for it, so before I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think twice about it if I did this, Um, and I mean, I obviously have to make an amends, and I have to talk to my sponsor about it with her, but um, it's just interesting that I actually care now. Like, before I wouldn't have cared, and I would just kind of brush it off, but now I'm just like, I have a conscience almost. Um, and, <laughs> yeah, it's it's not it's not fun to do stuff that's dishonest, especially when you work a program and you're in AA. It's just you can't really justify it, especially when you know better. And I didn't know better before, when, before I got sober. Um, you know, my life today is really full. I'm going to school. I work. Um, and it's really interesting because the school that I go to, the job that I had, I had both of those things before I got sober. And now I'm at the same job, same school, and I'm sober. So the experience is completely different. And it's kind of amazing how my life comes full circle due to this program. Um, I don't know. If you're new, I I really suggest giving it a shot and saying, um, I really didn't want to be here at all. I thought this was, like, the loser crew. This is where, like, weirdos go <laughs> or something. Um, but I'm so proud to be part of AA and so proud to be an alcoholic because... I have a program, and a lot of people don't have that. Even if they are alcoholics, they they could use a program. A lot of people could use a program. So um, that's all I have tonight, but thank you for letting me share. That's funny. You bring up something um, that I talk about. I have a lot of normie friends. I have a lot of civilians. And so... (laughs) You know, I'll talk, I'll try and talk to them for a moment about my mind and what it's doing, and I'll go, well, you know, I have some of that too. And the truth is, you know, it's the spiritual malady that we're talking about, and the fact is the difference between them are that they might have a drink or take a pill, and they don't have the physical allergy, and they the next day will go on. Me, because I have that physical allergy, I don't have that luxury. And so my spiritual malady, if left untreated, I will die because I will drink again or use again. And and that's just, that's, that's one of the differences. Astrid. Hi, I'm Astrid. I'm an alcoholic. Thanks for your share. It was really good to hear you and good to see you here. And um, I related to so many things that you said. And, you know, when I came here, I I had no self-awareness. I'd never even really considered the concept of looking at my mind or looking at how I react or respond throughout the day. And it was very, um, it was such a revolutionary thing for me because I knew that I was in continuous turmoil, but I kept thinking that it was the outside world that was creating the turmoil. And then really, upon looking inwardly, I realized that the calls were coming from inside the house and that I was actually the self-manufacturer of my own misery. And it used to be really hard for me to walk through any kind of crisis or problem or drama 
And I'll tell you, I've had 72 hours of a really good drama going on, and I feel like I get, like, an A- minus or a B plus. On Thursday, my daughter's catalytic converter got sawed off, and she's a nanny, and she's a nanny, and she has to be at this place, and the parents need to leave, and things need to happen. And she gets in her car, and it sounds like, you know, the world is blowing up because the catalytic converter, when it's missing, is so loud. So, you know, she calls me, and the neighbor looks under there, and there's no catalytic converter. It's been sawed off, and now the drama starts. And it's been 72 hours of drama. It's like AAA, and then they tow it to one Honda place, and the Honda place doesn't have the part because all the parts are gone in all of Los Angeles because so many catalytic converters are being stolen because they're gold lined with gold. And then we had to tow it to another place, and you can only get it towed for nine miles, and then you have to pay for all the mileage, and we go to the other place, and then they say we're backed up, and it's going to be another couple of days, and then it's an enterprise rent a car and then it's transferring money over and then she's late for work and then she's late for work again and it just goes on and on and on and of course adjusters and police and claim reports and man oh man you know and it's weird because usually my days are really smooth and I never have like eight things that really have to be dealt with like a lot of things and a lot of people and a lot of phone calls and then she spent the night over last night, and we needed to go pick up the car, and then we needed to find somebody that would weld the living crap out of the thing so that nobody could could steal it. And everyone's like, good luck with that. And you know what? I called frickin' Radio Bob. And he knew somebody that was waiting for me right then and there that charged me $60, and the guy did this this outrageous weld. He goes, well, I'll do it. They're not going to get that. They're going to have to buzz and make noises. <laughs> You know, and I feel like beaten by my disease because it took a tremendous amount of awareness to stay, stay, stay. And there were those moments where my daughter was like, oh, God, and I'm like, stop it. Put the phone down. Did you call them? Why did you say that? Did you just shut up? You know, and then we'd get really cool again and try to be okay, and then it would sort of flare up. But the bottom line is this. I'm telling you, I handled the situation that used to baffle me. I used to just crawl into bed, and I can't deal. I don't know what to do. You figure it out because I can't even manage. I just a stone Stolen catalytic converter would have been way more than I could handle. And I was a mom today, you know, and I was a mom for 72 hours in a big catalytic converter crisis. And in the end, I actually gave her my brand new car that I worked so hard for and paid for. And I took the Honda because I know that they're going to try to steal the catalytic converter again. And why do I say all this? I say this because I have a good life today. And I have quality problems, and it's really okay, and I'm going to sleep so well tonight. And I brought God into every moment, and I live by spiritual principles, and I tried to practice the principles in every single affair. I wasn't perfect, but man, oh man, it was so much better than it ever was before. I met each one of those people with a smile and a thank you, and I was courteous. And you know what? My life is good today. I Honestly, I really, really can't complain. It's so much better than it was before. Thank Thank you for letting me share. How's it going? My name is uh, Austin. I'm a drug addict, alcoholic. First of all, I'd like to thank my brother Tom in the back right here for taking me to this meeting. Um, I've never been to rehab before. I think I got about coming up on 40 days sober. Um, yeah, yeah. You know... Um, I grew up in a fraternal organization. My great-grandpa helped invent the sonar. Um, my grandpa did espionage for Germany. Um, he's, a, he's a U.S. soldier, so you know, God bless his heart. He just passed away a couple years ago from prostate cancer. And uh, you're talking about God and finding spirituality. And I was looking to LSD, DMT, methamphetamine, cocaine to find my higher power. And... Uh, it wasn't working out. There's was a left-handed path in life. It wasn't working for me at all. And um, having my brother Tom take me to this meeting and seeing you guys and uh, going through the steps, I'm just a beginner in this. But um, I can say it's working. I can, I can find a uh, spiritual awakening and find my God without uh, the use of drugs or alcohol. So, again, I'd like to thank my brother Tom, and uh, God bless. Thanks, Rick. I'm an alcoholic. Thank you. That was really cool. Um, yeah, I, I'm really glad to be here. And um, yeah, and thanks, Ashford. That was really funny. I, I had 
a really challenging experience this week. Um, and I spoke here last week, and I was like all high on God and all that other nonsense. <laughs> and then I went back to my real life, and uh, <laughs> and I had to take a final in a statistics class that I've been taking, and it was just one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, and, and, of course, being a good alcoholic I am, I obsessed completely. Like, getting good grades is just, like, not – like, getting less than an A is not an option for me. And, like – and I beat myself down. I hurt myself studying for this test. And um, and I showed up after not being able to sleep for however many days because once that thing kicks in, I don't know what's going to happen. Like, once my obsession goes, once my alcoholism is running – I don't know. I just like drinking. It's like if I let that stuff go, it's just like being on a run. I don't know where it's going to go. And so I find myself after being on a run in front of this exam and the first question I don't get. And I and I know this stuff. I know I know this stuff. And my ego is just kind of ballistic. And, um, and I freak out. I'm like, oh, God, what am I going to do? And, like, all of the tiredness and all the story about what it all meant and how I've wasted all my time just came pouring in. Alcoholism, full-blown, while I've got to take a test. And uh, and go figure. You know what I did? I started to pray. <laughs> and I don't believe in God. I don't. It's funny. I mean, you talk, and, and that's just my trip. But I know that when I do this stuff, it has a real effect. Like, I don't need to believe in God. I have faith in the fact that when I practice the principles, you know, with my full intention, with an open heart, open mind, it happens. And the thing is, that doesn't mean I don't have alcoholism. So I sat there in waves of, like, total self abnegation and just kept going back down. And this test was, like, micro numbers, hundreds of them. And the idea that I could actually pay attention and pay attention to detail... There was no way that could happen before. No way. And I'd learned, so I'd studied. So there was footwork. It's a good metaphor. Like, I did a lot of the, the, the lead-up work. But when the time came, I needed God, period. And I sat there and watched every number and did every single thing, every single calculation with a power greater than myself. And I got a 78 on this test. I thought I failed. But, you know what? And, and, and for me, at the end of the test, I failed. Like, my voice was, the voice in my head was, you failed. You're done. And I walked out of there feeling ill. And, you know, that story kind of won. But I took the test, and I did all right. I passed. And then I found out when I got home, after, like, eating an entire box of chocolate, um, <laughs> that I got an A in the class. And, and the thing is, that doesn't matter. I learned about the learning experience, and I learned about what I was there for. That was the real lesson for this class. And, that, I mean, it's funny because I'm happy that I got an A. Don't get me wrong. But, like, the payoff that that was supposed to give me, I, I didn't matter. Like, I did my best, and it wasn't good enough in alcoholism, period. But it doesn't matter. And then, you know, I mean, I, 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 when I had the experience of seeing that the, the grade was what it was, um, I was happy. But the other side was that I got to see that, like, this thing – it's really intense, and it really does run my life, and it doesn't matter whether I can't see the truth. I'm the, the defiance you talk about. I'm defiant. If reality is not what I want it to be, I don't have to participate. That's what defiance is. Tebow talks about that. I, it's not just, you know, screw you, I'm not going to do what you tell me. It's screw this. I don't have to play this game. I'm taking my ball, and I'm going home. And I, you know, part of the thing in this exam, this, this class was that I kept staying. I wanted to quit so bad because I wasn't perfect. And I was able to just stay in there. And in the end, it worked out. And I mean, if nothing else, that's a really good lesson. Thanks. Hi, Steve Alcoholic. Hi, Steve. See, thanks for your share. Um, Okay, so for the first time, I hadn't seen it before, but uh, so today I watched The Wolf of Wall Street (laughs) twice. (laughs) If you haven't seen it, don't watch it alone. I mean, there's some movies that show our disease in action, and then there's Scorsese doing it. And uh, 
So, um, <clears throat> you know, in three weeks, um, I, I, I found this meeting uh, right after I turned seven years sober. And uh, in three weeks, for the third year in a row, on Saturday night, you know, Astrid's going to give me a cake, and, and this one's for ten, and, and that's, like, really, really exciting. And John will give me a cake the first time on, on the Monday night meeting. And, um, you know, I'm watching this movie, and it's just amazing, because I have all this uh, false uh, jealousy and envy of what I wish I had, and if I had, everything would be so great, and, um, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, I guess, um, a reality check of, like, really what's important, and uh, where's the gal, she came back, um, about stealing, you know, when I got here three years ago, my, uh, disease of alcoholism, Alcoholism had manifested itself in a gambling addiction, and I've, I've come to learn that many of us that find prime time with many years of sobriety, we have these secondary and, and tertiary ways of manifesting our ism, and they're much harder. Not gambling is way harder than not drinking and using drugs, uh, you know, ever was, but... When I got here uh, in the business that I'm in, we get samples all the time, and I wasn't using them with my clients. I was selling them, and um, so, you know, most of the time I don't find it necessary to do that anymore. Um, I suffer, I haven't said this out loud, anyways, I have, I suffer from chronic um, debilitating back issues. And um, so there are times, I don't want to be recorded here. Anyways, you know, I get, a, you know, I get, I get, uh, I get stuff from my pain management team and then I deal with the spiritual part of that with my sponsor. And if I need to fill the tank, you know, I always have a way to fill the tank because I can, you know, sell. And... Um, and so I've done that in sobriety. God and I haven't done that in sobriety. I've done that in sobriety. And, um, you know, God bless my first sponsor here at, at uh, Primetime, Bill G. Because he taught me to say, um, God, you sure have your work cut out for you. Because I can't do it alone and I'm quite the mess. So uh, thanks for letting me share. Hey, Jonathan Shaw, recovering alcoholic. Thank you, man. It's good hearing from you and everybody else that shared. You know, it's like I've been in AA for like 28 years, okay, and unsuccessfully for 10 years, you know, I was dry as a bone and I relapsed. And I came back about 13 years ago and I've been in you know, in and around prime time ever since, you know, and I've learned a lot of this stuff. But the mind of an alcoholic like me is so insidious that it doesn't, you know, it, it's like you think we would evolve, you know, in some, on some level. But, you know, a lot of the alcoholism I, I see so clearly is in you, you know. <laughs> And, you know, there's an old saying in AA, like, if you can spot it, you probably got it. So, you know, I've, I've come to realize that, you know, the thing I don't like about so many people, and there's a lot of things I don't like about a whole lot of people, is the things that I deeply identify with as being my character defects. You know, and it's it's really painful to look at my character defects, but it's a lot less painful to look at yours, whoever you are, you know. And, you know, that's something that's really, you know, not serving me, obviously, in, you know, on the road of happy destiny. And, you know, like, like has been said a lot tonight, it's like once you been around here for a while and you hear this message it's almost like a directive to 
go to other fellowships. I mean, it's almost like, for me, all roads have led to Al-Anon and, uh, you know, and a handful of other 12-step fellowships because this disease has, you know, this irritating habit of, of shape-shifting, you know, and it's like, I can't put the plug in the jug, I don't drink, you know, now suddenly I'm, you know, like, uh, you know, spending like there's no tomorrow and I don't have any money or, you know, I become like a, you know, sex maniac or, you know, any number of things, a gluttonous human being, like eat until, you know, until I'm so fat I can't even look at myself in the mirror, you know, and all this kind of stuff, you know, and basically the roots of all this stuff is like, it's the same thing, it's the same thing that produced alcoholism, and, you know, this is a job, like recovery, man, that is a full-time job, man, there's no days off. You know, I have a daily reprieve contingent on the maintenance of my spiritual condition today. You know, if I think I'm going to rest on my laurels around here, there ain't no laurels. You know, I have not, you know, accomplished that much that I can just kick back and, you know, think for one minute that I'm not privileged to be recovering from a hopeless state of mind and body. You know, this is a pretty good deal. But I gotta do it. Thanks. Hi everyone. My name is Jed. I'm an alcoholic and a recovering perfectionist. Um, thank you very much for your share. I have not shared in a meeting for a long time, and that's not like me. So I really felt compelled to um, kind of get up and open my mouth. Um, and I really like the stuff that I've been hearing so far. Um, especially the stuff about, um, you know, our spiritual malady. You know, it's interesting. Um, you know, I uh, celebrated seven years in March, and um, the last couple years for me um, have been really challenging years in recovery. And um, my first five years, I, I shit you not, I, I oh, sorry, not that language. I kid you not, um, I, I think I was just being clouding for my whole five years. Um, and I really thought I was just, um, God and I were, we were on the same page and I got this thing and I worked this thing and I got the sponsees like with less than a year and I just took action, action, action. And I was in it and I knew I was in it. But here's the truth. I think what I realized is that they say that pain is the touchstone to, per to spiritual growth. And I never really understood that. Um, because I wasn't really experiencing a lot of pain. Um, I had, there were painful things happening in life, but not real pain. And in the last couple of years, I dealt with a couple surgeries, and then I had to end a two-year relationship, and I had to move her out. And then one of my closest um, childhood friends OD'd and died three months ago. That kind of capped it. And um, I had never felt a dealt with um, the trifecta of pain and really not having a higher power that I could trust. And I didn't know that. I really just did not know that. Um, and, you know, what's happened is, is that now I'm finally starting to see it as the great gift of my recovery so far. Um, I wouldn't have said that um, for the last couple of years. I would have said that this is BS. This is not what I signed up for. But guess what that is? That's Jed's Will Run Riot. That's me thinking that I know the deal, and I don't. And, you know, what I'm really praying and hoping for is that this attitude I have now which I think is finally one of humility, um, finally one that comes from a humble place, finally really believing that I don't know the answer, is that now I can grow with a God of my understanding. Maybe from here I can trust in this source that has kept me sober through all this. I'm still standing here, and I'm still sober. Um, you know, I'll tell you, um, you know, I grew up Jewish, and... You know, there was, there's a lot of, there's a lot of crap growing up Jewish. And, um, <laughs> and, um, you know, the big thing, um, we don't get on our knees. You know, it's just, it's just not the religion. It's just not, we don't get on our knees and we don't come to God this way. Um, and, you know, I've heard in these rooms for these last seven years, you've got to get on your knees and you got to pray. you got to get on your knees. And I'm, it's like the one thing that I've just been like, no, I'm not. I don't have to get on my knees to have a relationship with God. And 
So this morning, I, had, I don't even know what the hell came over me. I, I got up this morning, and instead of grabbing for my other god, my phone, that's my other god, um, as I've heard this before, that the first thing that you grab for in the morning, that's your god. So I guess that's my god. So instead of grabbing for my god, um, I just, I like, I said, what's up to my pup? You know, I did that first, gave him a little bit of love, and then I just kind of rolled out of bed, and I actually got on my knees, and I I just said, all right, I'm here, you know, I'm here. I'm here, I don't know what to say, I do have a routine, I do there's a prayer, I do all these prayers, but that is after I've already done the phone and all the other stuff, and then I've taken my shower and then my meditation. This time, I just got up, and the first thing I did is I just reached out to this higher power. I reached out to this source, and I did it from my knees in a humble state of humility. And that's it. I don't know. I don't know. Other than that, I just felt like I just needed to open my mouth about something. John, alcoholic. So I'm hearing a bunch of things tonight that I'm relating to and, and applying that apply to <clears throat> what's been going on for me the last uh, few days. Um, and uh, thanks for your share. I uh, I liked hearing about the the lower power and the higher power. There's something about how you put it tonight that really <clears throat> kind of rung a little louder for me in terms of, you know, I do. I, I have a lower power. And he's really low, and he's in the basement, and and he wants me to do do what I want to do. And then the higher power, you know, it's really up high and hard to reach, and you gotta stand on your toes sometimes. Um, and I, I, the, uh, it just, I walk around with these two powers. And, you know, just the idea that you walk around with two powers. I mean, it's, I yeah, I walk around every day. You know, I have the opportunity of which one that I'm gonna. Uh, talk more to, but I've been talking to this alcoholic who's the past few days, or you know, it seems like it's he's coming and going. You know, he's had a lot of sobriety, a lot of years, and you know, in in prime time, and um, but he's talking about things in a way that 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 um, I don't know. If, if he's crazy, um, or if I'm crazy, or if I should just not listen to him, or if I should keep listening to him. And he's talking about the pain factory. You know, the world is a pain factory. And, and, uh, I've never really heard somebody say we live in a pain factory. And, 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 you know, this guy's been sober a long time, and I want to say to him things like, you've got a painful, tiny little God that, that is telling you this story. And, and, but then, then I feel like, uh oh, here it comes. Here comes that lower self, that lower power that thinks he knows something. And, and, and he's gonna get going again, the ego's gonna start building, and, and before I know it, I'm gonna say, you're right. This is a frickin' pain factory. You know, the world, it's a doomsday world, and, and there's no God that's big enough that can tell me that what's going on on the other side of the planet makes God look good. And, um, I, I, I so I've got a question. <laughs> Yeah, no, I do. The you talked, you mentioned, you mentioned the notion of of finding your power through the steps. You know, all twelve steps. I, I'm assuming you're saying all twelve steps. What does that mean? do you have? <laughs> what do you mean by that? 
by John. <laughs> um, yeah, so, okay, so for me, for me, in steps one and two, for me in step one, I, I you know, I really see and accept that I have this disease and my life is unmanageable and I come to believe, I'm willing to believe and come to believe and I turn my will and my life over to the care of God, to his care. And really, the third step is, is a decision and in prime time we talk about practicing um, building this relationship in step two and so, you know, I'm starting to build a relationship and, and I'm, I'm, doing the best I can at turning my will and my life over to the care of God. But there's there's an inventory that I haven't done yet that is full of character defects and full of delusion, and there's all this fear that's blocking me from truly having that relationship with God. So I go through an inventory process, and I am painstakingly honest, as honest as I can, with the help of a trusted sponsor to help show me where I'm self-deceived, because I'm so self-deceived, and I go through this inventory process, and, and I give my fifth step to my sponsor, and I see my character defects, I see my selfish attitudes, my selfish actions, and so I, I, and I see that they don't work for me. They haven't worked for me. And this is like a crash course. So I become willing to, as they say in step six, um, become entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character because they're objectionable in my life and, and they don't work. So I don't want to keep them. And up to this part, I'm, each step that I go through, I get more and more power. I, the relationship with this power gets stronger and stronger. And then I humbly ask God to remove my shortcomings, and I go through the amends process. And then I get to start living in step 10. I've, I've done steps 4 through 9. And so then it's the, it's the practice of living in steps 10 and 11 and cleaning up the wreckage of my past daily and staying awake. All of these steps help me to have a spiritual awakening and, and I've been asleep for so long. I didn't know I've had all of this. And each step gives me more and more clarity and, you know, I, I get to utilize this power that I found and I, I practice. I do these 10 step inventories and, you know, there's nowhere in the big book that it talks about doing a written inventory, but I have found it so beneficial to do a nightly, what I call a 10th step, 11th step review. I mean, I, I inventory, um, a few things because I am in another program. I mean, this is what I do. I inventory my food. I, you know, I'm clear about what I eat and I know what are my alcoholic foods for me. Um, you know, I inventory my assets and liabilities. What did I do well today? Who did I help? Where did I think of others? What did I do for myself, the self-care, you know, and, you know, where have I been self-deceived, you know, where, have I, have I been acting out in, um, a defect, what, what did I see in myself, what did I un- uncover, and all of these things I do, I review it, I take the correct, I ask God for the corrective measures, you know, and I, I get to set, I get to make amends if I need to, and then I'm clear again, and this is a daily practice. And so, you know, in doing that and then working with others, I have a life truly beyond my wildest dreams. didn't look anything like I thought it would look when I got sober at 48 years old, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. Thanks. I'm Michael. I'm a recovering alcoholic, and I really enjoyed your your share. Astrid was laughing away at me there because I'm in that other program as well, you know. And I've heard uh, a lot of good things tonight about multiple addictions, and um, you know, I I suffer from multiple addictions. If it was, I just wish I was just a plain, simple alcoholic that could just uh, 
come to AA, put the plug in the jug and, and live happily ever after, but I'm not, unfortunately. And um, now I've got two sponsors in the room tonight, you know, and I'm sitting in between them both and, uh, you know, I need all the help I can get. I really do. I need all the help I can get. And, you know, I'm going through a really difficult time at the moment and it's really important that I get up and share about it because, uh, and happy birthday, Mike. Beautiful. Happy birthday. And, um, you know, last weekend I just felt terrible. You know, I just, just felt terrible and I'm doing two meetings a day and I'm still feeling terrible and I'm sponsoring people and I'm doing everything that's been asked of me and, um, you know, I'm just not feeling good at all. And, you know, the promises in the third step are just not true for me at all. And I think it's time, I think God's telling me it's time to, to really surrender again. And, um, you know, it, it's not about doing eight, nine meetings a week or sponsoring or reading a book every day. It's, I, I've got to find it deep within me to live, you know, live a real true 12 step life. And it's hard for me because my character by by nature is uh, one of fear and wanting to grab and if I don't get it, you know, hold a grudge and resentments and selfishness and dishonesty. I don't know where that came from. You know, I just don't know where that came from. And, and, it, and it's really alive and kicking in my life today. You know, and I was reading this before I came in, you know, and on 63, you know, we talk about steps one, two and three and... You know, when Craig took me through the steps and he pointed out the, the promises in step three, they really were alive for me and I, I felt really, I felt really at peace and I was really enjoying my life and they've disappeared. And uh, I'm, I'm asking myself and I'm asking God, why? Why have they disappeared? And it's because I've fallen back into that self-centeredness, you know, and I've fallen back into that chasing the prizes and the career and the, you know, the car and... and those things are good and well, there's nothing wrong with that. But, you know, they're now becoming more of a priority in my life than this program of recovery. And that's that's dangerous ground for me to be on. And, uh, you know, I want to share this. Last night I went to a meeting and, I, you know, I was talking to Tim and I, you know, I was driving home and I started bawling my eyes out. And I'm like, what is wrong with me? You know, what's wrong? You know, what's wrong with me? And, uh, you know, I talked to my fiance about it. She's in, in, you know, she's a recovering alcoholic. And, you know, I'm so lucky that I've got somebody that can come in and, you know, they can sit and listen to me and understand it. And I'm very lucky that I can come to a meeting like this and, and get up at the podium and share that with you. Cause I know you all know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm, you know what I'm talking about. And, uh, you know, I'm asking God at the moment to, to come back into my life and to, and to direct me and show me what to do. And, uh, you know, not to have, not to think of myself all the time, my little plans and designs and see what I can contribute back into the flow of life because that's left me. And, uh, you know, without God, um, there's always going to be a problem. There is always going to be a problem. And, uh, living in fear and resentment and selfishness and dishonesty is not the way I want to live. You know, and, um, I just wanted to share that tonight, and I'm feeling a lot better, Linya, beautiful woman, and amazing recovery in both programs, and, uh, you know, I just, uh, I wanted to get up here tonight, and I feel much better when I'm in this room, and around people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Thanks. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.